Since they began dating two years ago, millions of words have been written and spoken about Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. It was the public outing that every dedicated royal watcher has been waiting for. Their lives have been analysed, their relationships scrutinised, but while journalists and commentators continue to have their say, two people know the story better than anyone, Harry and Meghan themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, Meghan Markle. In this program, their speeches. It just wasn't right and something needed to be done. Their interviews. So I'd love to have kids right now, but you know, there's, there's, a, there's a process that one has to go through. And home movies. Uh, this, is the after, this is the aftermath of the audition. And Meghan isn't, you know, the typical type of royal bride. And I am burning up. She had put so much of herself out there. This is what I do at Duff Throw. All brought together for the first time. At the end of the day, you know, I'm a human being, I'm just a normal person like these guys are. Their lives are an open book. And that means we've painted a very quick picture of them together. This is the story of Harry and Meghan in their own words. Thank you so much. This afternoon, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle stepped hand in hand into the sunken garden at Kensington Palace. November 27th, 2017, and Harry and Meghan broke the news the world had been waiting for. <laughs> 17 months after their first meeting, they were in love and about to be married. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I was yeah. like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. She said, can I say yes, can I say yes now? And then, then there was hugs and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? And she goes, oh yes, the ring. <laughs> Although this was the first time they'd spoken as a couple, both had long experience of talking about themselves. Raised worlds apart, they'd chronicled their experiences from childhood. For Megan, that was spent in Los Angeles, California, where she was born to her white father, Tom, and African-American mother, Doria. It was the late 70s when my parents met. My dad was a lighting director for a soap opera, and my mom was a temp at the studio. I like to think he was drawn to her sweet eyes and her afro, plus their shared love of antiques. Whatever it was, they married and had me. They moved into a house in the valley in LA, to a neighborhood that was leafy and affordable, what it was not, however, was diverse. And there was my mom, caramel in complexion, with her light-skinned baby in tow, being asked where my mother was, since they assumed she was the nanny. <laughs> nice, huh? You like these ponytails? With both parents working in the Hollywood entertainment industry, Megan developed an early love of the stage. She would often visit her father as he worked behind the scenes on a long-running TV sitcom. <laughs> it was considered so risque, some viewers even organised a boycott. Uh, there was a show called Married with Children. Do you seen it, that seen show? it, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So uh, I grew up on the set of Married with Children every day after school for 10 years. I was there. Wow. I know. It's a very perverse place for a little girl who went to Catholic school, no less, to grow up. <laughs> There were a lot of times my dad would say, Meg, why don't you go and help with the craft services room over there? This is just a little off color for your eyes. I wasn't allowed to watch it at home. I could watch the end credits, so I could give the screen a kiss when I saw my dad's name go by. I, I mean, they seemed very close as father, daughter, and I mean, she was a striking child. She was beautiful and everyone would comment on how cute she was. But 
beyond that and more important than that was the fact she was just a very nice little girl and very respectful and uh, just really a sweet kid to be around. Megan's parents divorced when she was still at primary school. She and her mother Doria lived in a relatively comfortable neighborhood. But LA at that time was riven by racial tensions and in April 1992, they boiled over. The acquittal of four white policemen filmed beating a black motorist sparked nearly a week of ferocious rioting. The city pretty much burned in South Los Angeles. The skies were black, you know, ashes everywhere. Um, you didn't know how far they were going to reach or you didn't think they were going to stop. It was kind of just like being in another world. The violence claimed 63 lives. 2,000 people were injured and 12,000 arrested. As it spread north towards Megan's school, the 10-year-old and her mother had to run for shelter. They had let us go home during the riots and there was ash everywhere. Oh my God, mommy, it's snowing. No, Flower, it's not snow. Get in the house. So I can imagine any parent would want to keep their child inside because um, when your city's burning, when uh, you fear for your life, you, children shouldn't have, to, shouldn't have to experience that. As Meghan was being raised in LA, Harry was growing up in London and in public. As the youngest son of the world's most famous woman, he was in the media spotlight from day one. When it comes to dealing with the press, Prince Harry has a style all of his own. But despite the constant presence of the cameras, Princess Diana was determined to surround Harry and his older brother William with laughter and fun. Our mother was a total kid through and through. When everybody says to me, you know, so she was fun, give us an example. All I can hear is her laugh in my head. And that sort of crazy laugh of where there was just pure happiness shown on her face. When you look at Prince Harry as a child, there was always a sense that he was a lot more mischievous than his older brother, perhaps because he knew that he didn't have as much responsibility on his shoulders. One of her mottos to me was, you can be as naughty as you want, just don't get caught. She was one of the naughtiest parents. She would come and watch us play football and you know, smuggle sweets into our socks. And I mean, like literally walking back from a football match and having sort of five packets of Starburst and just the whole shirt was just bulging with sweets. I think that very much appealed to Prince Harry's character and sense of humour, this idea that he could be a bit of a royal rebel like his mum and still get away with it. As part of his privileged upbringing, Harry was sent to Weatherby School in London's Notting Hill, where fees are more than £7,000 per term. At the same time, Meghan, three years his senior, was a pupil at Los Angeles' Little Red Schoolhouse. With its strong academic and artistic reputation, it was a favorite for Hollywood families. But some of the city's most deprived areas were just a short drive away, areas she'd frequently visit along with both her parents. My mom and dad came from Little, so they made a choice to give a lot buying turkeys for homeless shelters at Thanksgiving, delivering meals to patients in hospice care, donating any spare change in their pockets to those asking for it. This is what I grew up seeing, so that is what I grew up being. A young adult with a social consciousness to do what I could and to, at the very least, speak up when I knew something was wrong. Meghan's campaigning character was only just forming, but it would soon propel her onto the national stage. 
In 1993, the young schoolgirl took on a powerful multinational corporation, taking her complaint all the way to the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Meghan Markle. As a successful actress, Meghan has used her profile to champion a range of different causes. Well, good evening. That doesn't feel like enough. Does but her it? campaigning just... efforts began long before she found fame. The fact that Meghan is interested in these causes, that's not new. It's, uh, it's not something that she's taken up after a, a life of celebrity that she's suddenly found out that she needs to help people. It really started from, from the very beginning when she was just a little girl. There is a story about how she was very proactive in protesting about an advertisement uh, that she felt was very denigrating to women. The gloves are coming off. Women are fighting greasy pots and pans with ivory clear. The tagline said, women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. <laughs> Two boys from my class said, yeah, that's where women belong, in the kitchen. I remember feeling shocked and angry and also just feeling so hurt. It just wasn't right and something needed to be done. My name is Megan Markle, I'm 12 years old. Last week at my school, we decided to watch the news for social studies. While flipping through the channels, we saw a commercial for the new ivory clear dishwashing liquid. In the commercial, they said women are battling grease, meaning only women do dishes. When I heard this, the boys... In Megan my wrote to Procter & Gamble, the company behind the ad, to America's then First Lady Hillary Clinton, and to the US TV program Nick News which sent a reporter to interview her. I don't think it's right for kids to grow up thinking these things, that just mom does everything. So I was wondering if you would be able to change your commercial to people all over America. Thank you, Meghan Markle. Incredibly, the 12-year-old's lobbying campaign worked. And it was roughly a month later when the soap manufacturer, Procter & Gamble, changed the commercial. The gloves are coming off. People are fighting greasy pots and pans with ivory clear. She had a sense that she could affect change even though she was just one small person. She had a voice. If you see something that you don't like or offended by on, te on television or any other place, write letters and send them to the right people and you can really make a difference for not just yourself but lots of other people. Makes me feel Megan's time in the spotlight lasted for just a few days in 1993. But by then, Harry was used to relentless media attention. Soon it would become uncomfortable, both for him and his elder brother, William. The reason? Their mother's very public and very bitter split from Prince Charles. It must be pretty tough when uh, one day your father says it's all over and you've got to split your time between here or with your mother. When he was the youngest, he must have seen the arguments and the rows together they'd had and it had an effect on him. Charles and Diana officially divorced in 1996. In August 1997, she went on holiday with her new boyfriend, Dodi Fayed. Pursued by the paparazzi through the streets of Paris, their chauffeur-driven car crashed in a city centre tunnel. Three people were killed, including Diana. My mother had just died, and I had to walk a long way behind her coffin, surrounded by thousands of people watching me while millions more did on television. I think everybody who witnessed 
the funeral and that young child walking behind his mother's coffin reflected on it and thought, goodness me, what effect is this going to have on this boy's life growing up? I don't think any child should be asked to do that under any circumstances. I don't think it would happen today. Well, we now know actually the true effect that Diana's death had on both Harry and William. Prince Harry spoke extremely openly about the fact that that had a profound effect, that he completely went off the rails, he couldn't cope with it. I can safely say that losing my mum at the age of 12 and therefore shutting down all of my emotions for the last 20 years has had a, a, a quite serious effect on, on not only my personal life but also my work as well. My way of dealing with it was yeah, sticking my head in the sand, refusing to ever think about my mum because why, why would that help? It's only going to make you sad, it's not going to bring her back. So from an emotional side, I was like, right, don't ever let your emotions be part of anything. Obviously, you know, it, he speaks from the heart. I mean, Diana was a super mother and to lose that person just so, such a young age, uh, must have been terrible for him. And he said that, how much he misses her, how much he thinks of her every day. Not a day goes by he doesn't think of her, and I can understand that. Probably been, the, been very close to, to a complete breakdown on, on numerous occasions when all sorts of grief and sort of uh, lies and misconceptions and everything's coming at you from every angle. Diana's funeral was watched by an estimated 2.5 billion people around the world. Among them, 16-year-old Meghan Markle. By then, she was a student at the all-girl Immaculate Heart High School in Los Angeles. Here, just two miles from Hollywood, her acting ambitions were taking shape. Long before I taught Meghan, um, I saw her in the school plays. And she was one of those girls when she was on stage you were drawn to watch her because she just had this charisma and this charm and she was really good. We have a musical and a play every year. And she was certainly one of the many shining lights that we have here at Immaculate Heart. Megan's stage talents led her to enroll on a university course in theater. Before joining, she auditioned for roles in music videos. After the ma aftermath of uh, the Pat's after audition. This is the aftermath of the audition. And it went pretty well. We just had to dance crazily. And um, so I did. And it was um, tiring. We just all danced like wild women. And I was shaking my hair around. And so that's, that's that. And I am burning up. The Los Angeles of 1998 had recovered from the riots of seven years earlier. But racial prejudice remained close to the surface, as Meghan was soon to witness firsthand. I was home in LA on a college break when my mom was called the N-word. We were leaving a concert and she wasn't pulling out of a parking space quickly enough for another driver. My skin rushed with heat as I looked to my mom her eyes welling with hateful tears. I could only breathe out a whisper of words so hushed they were barely audible. It's okay, mommy. I was trying to temper the rage-filled air permeating our small silver Volvo. This is something that has happened for people of color since we've been brought to this country some 400 years ago. It's unfortunate because racism hurts. You know, just to talk about it, it, hurt, it hurts. And kids don't need to hurt. They shouldn't have to. I shared my mom's heartache, but I wanted us to be safe. We drove home in deafening silence, her chocolate knuckles pale from gripping the wheels so tightly. When Megan returned to her university near Chicago, she showed huge promise on stage, starring in a number of student movies. But soon the undergraduate was keen to spread her wings and take on other subjects. Mm -hmm. 
I had always been the theater nerd at Northwestern University. I knew I wanted to do acting, but I hated the idea of being this cliche, a girl from LA who decides to be an actress. I wanted more than that. And I'd always loved politics, so I ended up changing my major completely and double majoring in theater and international relations. As part of her degree, Megan won an internship at the US Embassy in Argentina. In 2002, the country was in financial crisis. Megan was sent to greet a top White House official, whose car was then surrounded by placard-waving demonstrators. It was their economic devaluation, and our Secretary of the Treasury at the time was there. So I'm 20 years old, in Buenos Aires, in a motorcade, doing that whole thing. I thought for sure I would still have a career in politics. And then I came back to LA for Christmas, and a friend of mine from college introduced me to this manager. The manager had watched one of Megan's student films, and said he could find her cinema and TV work in return for a 10% cut of her earnings. But, as she was soon to discover, the competition for roles was fierce. A young actor, actress, trying to break into the business, it is not easy. My parents had been so supportive, watching me audition, trying to make ends meet, taking all the odds and ends jobs to pay my bills. I was doing calligraphy, and I was a hostess at a restaurant, and all those things that actors do. There's so many people out here who want to get into the entertainment industry. Uh, it's, it's difficult. I had a beat-up Ford Explorer Sport that rattled like a steamboat engine in the morning. It was burning out. I had started to give up. It was tired and running on empty, going from audition to audition, just as I was. I mean, you really have to be very self-promoting and you have to be willing to, you know, knock on doors and be very um, motivated and have good self-esteem because you could get eaten alive out here. I would drive to auditions and park at the back of the parking lot, far from the eyes of anyone who could see me unlocking the trunk and crawling into my car through its only feasible entry point. I would play it off, obviously, as though I was looking for something, reaching so deep for something that my car almost sucked me in to get it. Much like my experience in Hollywood, to be honest. Struggling, climbing hurdles, searching for something that I couldn't even see, and just reaching for it. Now in her mid-twenties, the most Megan had to show for her efforts were bit parts in soap operas, TV dramas, and the odd movie. In 2006, she became a briefcase girl on the American version of the quiz show Deal or No Deal, recording up to seven shows a day. For somebody like Megan, um, appearing as essentially an adornment on a game show would not be her ideal job. I'm sure she appreciated the paycheck, but she would have felt creatively unfulfilled. I would put that in the category of things I was doing while I was auditioning to try to make ends meet. I was the ill-fated number, which for some reason no one would ever choose. I would end up standing up there forever in these terribly uncomfortable and inexpensive five-inch heels, just waiting for someone to pick my number so I could go and sit down. Despite her setbacks and disappointments in Hollywood, Megan persisted. And in 2011, her big break came in Canada. Can get that over the Success and fame beckoned. As well as marriage. By her late 20s, Meghan Markle was still struggling to make it in Hollywood. Along with the hurdles facing all young actresses, she had a further challenge her mixed race heritage. It took quite a few years for Meghan really to be comfortable with her identity. Hollywood didn't help with that, and it must have been very hurtful and very frustrating for her at times. I'm biracial. Most people can't tell what I'm mixed with, and so 
Much of my life has felt like being a fly on the wall. And so some of the slurs that I've heard, the really offensive jokes or the names, it's just hit me in a really strong way. Being ethnically ambiguous, as I was pegged in the industry, meant I could audition for virtually any role. I wasn't black enough for the black roles, and I wasn't white enough for the white ones, leaving me somewhere in the middle as the ethnic chameleon who couldn't book a job. But the breakthrough was getting closer. At one audition, a casting director advised Megan to adopt a more natural look. She stopped me in mid-scene and said, so simply, you need to know that you're enough. She saw all that self-doubt beaming through the self-tanner and excessive blush. You need to know that you're enough. Less makeup, more Megan. And that moment for me was a wake-up call. As Meghan edged closer to fame, Harry was doing his best to escape the media spotlight. After finishing his studies at Eton, he took a gap year, then enrolled at the Sandhurst Royal Military Academy, passing out in 2006. A year later, he served in Afghanistan. This is not a rehearsal. This is war. Prince Harry taking on the Taliban and coming under fire. The army had deployed Harry to the front line in secret. The media were only allowed to report on it as his 20-week tour of duty came to an end. This is what I do, duck throw. At the end of the day, you know, I'm a human being. I'm just a normal person like these guys are. You know, I don't know, it's just, it's just nice to be. I, I wouldn't expect the, the British public to, to make much of it. I think they would just turn around and go, yep, good on him, good on the people who got him out there. Um, he's a soldier, so what, basically? So what? So what if he goes out there? My husband went out there and he died. So what if he goes out there? The, the, the general uh, opinion, and hopefully so. He was very good at his job. He was very competent, he, uh, and he fitted in very well with everyone that he worked with. There was no airs and graces with Harry. He just wanted to be treated the same as everybody else, which he was. And he didn't expect any sort of special favours, being the uh, Queen's grandson. Harry's determination to be treated the same as other soldiers won him praise from the media. But newspapers were less impressed by his behaviour when off duty. In 2012, pictures of a semi-naked royal enjoying time off in Las Vegas made the front pages. It was probably a classic example of me probably being too much army and, and not enough prince. I don't really want to get into, in, into, into details of what I think or what other people think. You know, at the end of the day, I, you know, I probably let myself down, let my family down, I let other people down. But at the end of the day, you know, I was, I was in a private area and I sh there should be a certain amount of privacy that one should expect. Several months after the photos were published, Harry was on a second tour of duty in Afghanistan, this time as a captain and helicopter pilot. Approaching 30, he was making plans for a life post-army and fielding questions about his personal plans for the future. I don't think you can ever be urged to settle down. Um, you, if you find the right person and everything feels right, then it takes time, especially for myself and my brother. Um, you ain't ever going to find someone who's going to jump into the, to the position they would, that it would hold. Simple as that. By then, Meghan had found a long-term partner, American film and TV producer Trevor Engelson. They dated for seven years, marrying in 2011. That same year, she auditioned for a new TV legal drama, Suits, set in New York, but about to be filmed in Toronto. It was the fifth pilot I would have filmed. I remember hoping this one would see the light of day. Never would I have imagined that this show would not just change my career, but also change my life. Megan won the part of Rachel Zane, an ambitious young paralegal. After years of slog, it was her breakthrough role. 
the show proved to be a success. The USA Cable Network ordered a second series and Megan moved full-time to Canada to be near the studio. So Megan chose not to live in like the poshest area of Toronto. She chose Seton Village, which is more laid back, tree-lined, and people keep to themselves. And that's exactly what Megan did. So much so that her neighbors didn't even know who she was. But that was soon to change as her TV series became an international hit. As Meghan basked in her newfound fame, Harry was concentrating on building a new career. After the negative headlines surrounding his off-duty life, Harry became patron of the Invictus Games for injured servicemen and women, and he began supporting a range of causes that were close to his mother's heart. I'm particularly pleased to be with you today because my mother is patron very much, very much of my headway um, and the vital work that it does. And for me, that, that's good enough. He was also increasingly active in aid programs abroad, especially in Africa, where his Centre Bale charity is based. Centre Bale means forget me not. It's in memory of Princess Diana. I think actually Harry's been concerned that some of her good work has been undone in recent years. And a sense that he needs to carry on her good work, otherwise it would have been meaningless. Harry had first visited Botswana in southern Africa shortly after Diana's death. In the years afterwards, he'd made repeated journeys. This is where I feel more like myself than anywhere else in the world. I have this intense sense of normality here. To not get recognized, to lose myself in the bush with what I would call the most down-to-earth people on the planet. People dedicated to conservation with no ulterior motives, no agendas, who would sacrifice everything for the betterment of nature. I talk to them about their jobs, about what they do, and I learned so much. By 2013, Megan's TV series Suits had become a huge hit for the USA network. It was their most popular show for young adults, the audience advertisers valued the most. She was a star, and with stardom came power. Before filming series four, she complained to the program makers. This season, every script seemed to begin with Rachel enters wearing a towel. And I said, nope, not doing it anymore. Not doing it. I called the creator and I was like, it's just gratuitous. We get it. You've already seen it once. So I think at a certain point, you feel empowered enough to just say no. Megan was also starting to use her power in other ways. The charity World Vision made her a global ambassador, promoting sanitation projects in remote villages. Well, Megan's visits to countries like Rwanda have focused on uh, girls and women. All of these speak to her concern um, for female empowerment and really wanting to make a difference that way. You'll feel really good at the end of the day knowing that you've been a part of that. I gotta get these kids home. I'm gonna go take a picture with them. <laughs> Megan's fame had coincided with sadness in her personal life. In 2013, she and Trevor Engelson divorced after nine years together and two years of marriage. Although neither has ever spoken publicly about the split, commentators attributed it to the distance between them. While Meghan concentrated on her TV work in Toronto, he remained in LA. At 31, Harry was also unattached. Despite a series of girlfriends and a reputation as one of the world's most eligible bachelors. I said to Prince Harry, Prince Harry, when are you going to get married? And he said, um, when are you going to get married? 
Exactly, he's always had a string of pretty serious relationships with pretty serious women. He chose, for the longest period, Chelsea Davy, a very bright girl from Zimbabwe. But I don't think that worked simply because, although she loved him, she didn't love the status of monarchy and the baggage that he came with him. And then Cressida Bonus, again, another very bright spark, lovely girl. Again, loving Harry and being with Harry, but not the circus that comes around him. In 2015, a year after that latest split, Harry went on a tour of New Zealand and revealed his strong desire to start a family. Of course, I'd love to have kids right now, but yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a process that one has to go through. And, you know, I, tours like this is great fun. Um, hopefully I'm doing all right by myself. It would be great to have someone else next to me is to, sort of sh to share the pressure. But, you know, it, um, time will come. Whatever happens, happens, I guess. The relationship he craved was just a year away. When he first met Meghan in London in July 2016, they discovered much in common. Both their parents had divorced when they were young. They were famous, wealthy, and had a shared interest in the developing world. Well, it was one of the first things we started talking about when we met was just the different things that we wanted to do in the world and how passionate we were about seeing change. I think that was, um, that's what got date two. <laughs> Soon after that second date, their first holiday, Harry invited Meghan to the country he'd first visited in the aftermath of his mother's death, 19 years earlier. I think about three, maybe four weeks later, that I managed to persuade her to come and join me in Botswana. And we, and we, we, we camped out with each other under the stars. We spent, she came and joined me for five days out there, which was absolutely fantastic. So then we were really by ourselves, mm -hmm. um, which, I, which was crucial to me to make sure that we had a, a chance to, to get to know each other. Yeah. The couple kept their relationship secret throughout the summer of 2016. But then, at the end of October, the first headline appeared. You have a story like that and it breaks and the rest of Fleet Street is then playing catch-up. And it was then after the story broke that you found people descending on Meghan's house, chasing after anyone that ever knew her, chasing after family members. I think both of us were totally surprised by the, the reaction after the first five, six months of what we had to ourselves of what actually happened from then. So I think you can, you can have as many conversations as you want and try and prepare as much as possible, but we were, we were totally un unprepared for, for what happened after that. Some reports concentrated on Meghan's family neighbourhoods in LA. Others focused on the breakup of her parents' marriage and her relationships with her half-sister and half-brother. There's a misconception that because I have worked in the entertainment industry that this would be something I would be familiar with. That I've never been part of tabloid culture, I've never been in pop culture to that degree. And I think we were just hit so hard at the beginning with a lot of mistruths that I made the choice to not read anything. But some of the coverage and comments incensed Harry. You're breaking news from Kensington Palace this morning. Prince Harry After has eight days of headlines, statement. he came out fighting. I think that's one of the strongest statements I've know, ever heard I come know, out of a palace. November 2016. Just eight days after the story of Harry and Meghan's relationship broke, Kensington Palace went to war with the press. Prince Harry is worried about Miss Markle's safety and is deeply disappointed that he has not been able to protect her. It had the hallmarks of Harry's words and character all over it. It is not right that a few months into a relationship with him that Miss Markle should be subjected to such a storm. I think he was saying, look, this girl's important to me and I want to make sure that you're all careful in what you're doing. He knows commentators will say this is the price she has to pay and that this is all part of the game. He strongly disagrees. This is not a game, it is her life and his. I think that's one of the strongest statements I've know, ever heard I come know, out of a palace. I, I think so too. It's Incredibly really personal, personal statement. He is v obviously very, very angry. Well, good for him. 
I think the statement went down very well with the public in saying, yeah, fair on Prince Harry, this girl needs to be protected. I think others were a bit more critical, saying, well, all right, but you can't have it both ways. You get a lot of great publicity for your causes and you're the hero of the hour. If we want to find out about your private life, we're entitled to. Pouring over Meghan's private life continued. Journalists scoured her social media accounts looking for more clues about her relationship with Harry. They found she'd posted photos of herself with a bracelet similar to one worn by him. To all my TIG friends, after three beautiful years on this adventure with you, it's time to say goodbye. In April 2017, Meghan began withdrawing from social media, prompting more speculation that the couple were about to become engaged. She closed her successful lifestyle website, The TIG, posting a farewell message to all her readers. Keep laughing and taking risks and keep being the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you for everything, Meghan Markle. In the early autumn of 2017, the couple were seen in public for the first time. Harry attended the third Invictus Games in Toronto, and Meghan turned up in the crowd. It was the public outing that every dedicated royal watcher has been waiting for. Just 24 hours later, the couple abandoned any effort to keep their feelings for each other private. The setting for this first public date was extraordinary, with no attempts to hide away as they watched the wheelchair tennis at the Invictus Games. It was open to the public. Anybody could go and watch the wheelchair tennis match, although it has to be said, I don't know how many people were actually watching the wheelchair tennis match because a lot of people were watching Harry and Meghan. Just six weeks after their very public appearance, the couple had a very private moment. Meghan was staying with Harry at Nottingham Cottage, his two-bedroomed home set within the Kensington Palace estate. He proposed, and she accepted. The ring is, is obviously yellow gold, because that's what, um, her favorite. And the main stone itself, um, a source from Botswana, and the, uh, the little diamonds either side are from my mother's jewelry collection to make sure that she's with us on this, on this crazy journey together. Mm -hmm. um, and It's beautiful. And he designed yeah. it. It's incredible. Um, yeah. Yeah. And make sure it stays on that finger. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think your mother would have thought of Meghan or said about Meghan? Oh, these would be thick as thieves. <laughs> <laughs> Without question. I think she would be over the moon, jumping up and down, you know, so excited for, for me. But then, as I said, we'd have probably been best friends, best friends with Megan. So no, it's, I, you know, it's, it is days like days like today when when I really miss having her around and miss being able to share the, the happy news. But you know, with with the ring and with everything else that's going on, I'm sure she's. Uh, she's with us. I'm sure she's with us. You know, mm. you know, jumping up and down somewhere else. Since the announcement, Megan has become the fresh face of royalty, connecting with a new generation just as Harry's mother once did. I know that I'm in love with this girl, and I hope that she's in love with me, but we still had to sit down on the sofa, and I still, you know, I still had to have some pretty you know, frank conversations with her to say, look, you know, what you're letting yourself in for, it's a big deal. It's not, it's not easy for anybody, um, but I know that you know, at the end of the day, she, you know, she chooses me, and I choose her. Um, and therefore, you know, whatever, whatever we have to tackle together or individually will always be us together as a team. After a life spent on the other side of the Atlantic, Meghan is now planning to become a UK citizen. She and Harry have also spoken of their wish to tour the Commonwealth. But now, with their wedding fast approaching, their focus for the moment is firmly on May the 19th. We are a couple. We're in love. I'm sure there will be a time when we will have to come forward and present ourselves and have stories to tell. But I hope what people will understand is that this is our time. This is for us. It's part of what makes it so special that it's just ours. But we're happy. Personally, I love a great love story.
chuyện ngày xưa tôi thả những cánh diều dây lên trên bầu trời phiêu du cùng ăn mây hòa trong gió tiếng xa vang từ đâu diều bay vút cao rồi cùng nhau chia phe chơi trò chơi dưới bóng cây đa già bên sân đình bãi sông làm cô dâu chu dễ chịu kiều la trò chơi rước dâu niềm xưa mãi sống trong cuộc đời tôi thật tin tôi thơ rồi ngày tháng trôi đi bao nhiêu mong ước xa xưa chỉ còn là kỷ niệm từng đêm tôi nhớ về cuộc đời đua trên bốn bề giàu lo nhiều lúc ước mơ rằng được phép nhiệm mau đưa tôi về thuở xa xưa bay cao cùng cánh diều đôi chơi vây đám bạn hồn nhiên ngày thưa vui đôi ngày tháng để lòng tôi hân hoan giữa trời mây ngày xưa dấu yêu còn đâu trên bầu trời phiêu du cùng hang mây hòa trong gió tiếng sáng vang từ đâu diều bay vút cao rồi cùng nhau chia phe chơi tròn tiền dưới bóng cây đa già bên sân đình bãi sông làm cô dâu chu dễ chỉ kiều la trò chơi rước dâu kỷ niệm xưa mãi sống trong cuộc đời tôi thân tin tôi thơ rồi ngày tháng trôi đi bao nhiêu mong ước xa xưa chỉ còn là kỷ niệm từng đêm tôi nhớ về cuộc đời yêu trên bốn bề sầu lo như lúc ước mơ rằng được phép nhiệm mau đưa tôi về thuở xa xưa bay cao cùng cánh diều đôi chơi vơi đám bạn hồn nhiên ngày thơ vui đôi ngày tháng để lòng tôi hân hoan cùng trời mây ngày xưa dấu yêu còn đâu rồi ngày tháng trôi đi bao nhiêu mong ước xa xưa chỉ còn là kỷ niệm từng đêm tôi nhớ về cuộc đời đưa trên bốn bề sầu lo nhiều lúc ước mơ rằng được phép nhiệm mau đưa tôi về thuở xa xưa bay cao cùng cánh diều đua chơi với đám bạn hồn nhiên ngày thưa vui đôi ngày tháng để lòng tôi hân hoan giữa trời mây ngày xưa dấu yêu còn đâu